So you can adjust, like the zoom is on this okay. side. So I think we should probably move the camera up a little, yeah. and then we're going to zoom in a little. And Perfect. so as long as you can see yourself, yeah. then that's fine. Right. Or if you don't want to see yourself, you can stop and like zoom in on the screen Sounds if you're good. just going to talk. Do so. you think we're, are we able to turn off this light and still see? Um, I think this would be more important than my face. Yeah, let's, let's see what it looks like. Yeah, you yeah, can that's still probably see fine. Because you've got a spotlight on you, so as long mm -hmm. as you don't stray too far, that should yeah. be good. Yeah. And then I'll be back in like Sounds half an hour good. or so. Sounds good. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'll take that. All right. I think I might, I might start now. Um, all right. So last uh, last summer, I was lucky enough to get the Rick Mather internship and spent my summer working at Rick Mather Architects in London. Um, so today, I'm going to show you guys, um, first I'm going to show you some of their projects, and then I'm going to show you what I got to work on and what some of the other projects in the office were, and then I'll show you a little bit about the rest of my time in London when I wasn't working. Um, but I'll start out talking about some of their projects. Uh, so first off, a little bit about Rick Mather Architects. Uh, Rick Mather went to the University of Oregon in 1960. He graduated in 1961. And then in 1963, moved out to London to go to the AA. And he studied urban design and architecture there. And then by 1973, he started his own firm, which is Rick Mather Architects. Um, and his office since the beginning has been in Camden, which is a little bit north of central London. Um, and it's a pretty exciting neighborhood, uh, a lot of sort of centralized access to all the rest of the city. Um, and their office right now is at about 40 people. Um, this is sort of one section of the office. It's all on the top floor of this old building on a high street in London, um, and the office is made up of pretty young people. It's uh, generally, like, the two um, partners in the firm are around 40 years old, so it's, like, a really young office, lots of energy, great place to work. Um, so I'll just start by showing a few projects, um, some ideas that come through, and there's um, a major idea is this contextual modernism. Um, the buildings really fit within their historic dwellings, but they're still like really modern architecture, playing with materiality and um, form to blend in, yet still s still be their own special thing. So this is uh, sort of their first project that they did at Oxford. Um, and it's these top two buildings here. And it's a theater and dormitories for the college, Keeble College. 
in Oxford and um, some things they played with was the brick patterning, but also the placement of the building. Instead of sort of setting the building in the center of that green space, they actually created the green space by moving them off to the sides and creating a really nice courtyard space um, that they have big events at and the students can enjoy between classes. These are just some details, um, sort of inventive, using brick in different ways, turning it sideways. Um, I think one of the first projects to actually do it that way. So it's playing with the patterns of the brick to go along with the older buildings, but still stick out. Um, and these are just some details of that project. So even though it's a smaller building, the uh, dormitory it still has really exciting moments. Um, especially the staircases. This is another Oxford uh, project, and just sort of looking at the steps of contextualism. So that first one was totally new buildings, and this next one is uh, blending in with an old building. If you, it's a theater at um, Corpus Christi College in Oxford, and as you move in, the building itself becomes merged with the older fabric of the existing church. Um, you get a really beautiful result, and they do recitals and dance uh, dances in there. And then this is sort of the next level in that progression, where you have buildings that, this is probably their most famous project, but you can't even see their building from the outside, but as you go, and it makes a pretty impressive impact. This is the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, and it was completed in 2009. And this is sort of their famous staircase um, on the left. And they're tasked with doubling the square footage of this museum in about 50% extra floor area. So um, where the old, they put this whole new building in uh, sort of the courtyard of the existing project, which is uh, a building from 1841. Um, and so it's, they aren't allowed to see the new project from the exterior, so, uh, but it provides this really exciting moment. This is a detail, a model of that central atrium. And the way they fit double the square footage was by playing with levels. They managed to fit six levels in, but they made it feel larger by having double height spaces that sort of interlock with floating bridges. And as you work your way to the top, you can kind of see these pockets of space, um, really thin bridges, which are pretty spectacular. And then at the top, there's a roof terrace. And that's uh, something that you see in lots of their projects, they, like maximizing all the spaces. There's always going to be beautiful gardens, um, especially on the roofs. So it's a cool, it's a really great project to see. The next thing that's sort of big throughout all their projects is their use and experimentation with glass. Um, this is sort of the earliest project that really pushes the boundaries of glass. It's from 1989, and it's an all-glass extension that actually, those are glass beams. Um, the first time that anyone has ever used glass for structural beams, um, and it's double-glazed insulative glass. So you can have that extension and not overheat or anything. Um, so that, yeah, so if you look in some engineering books, you'll see this as like changing um, how glass is looked at and how glass is used in architecture. And so lots of his projects, you'll see um, the glass beams and glass structure being used throughout. This is their Virginia Museum of Fine Art, and it, features North America's largest gla glass structure. Um, that big wall on the left is a 40-foot glass wall. And it, instead of steel mullions, it uses glass mullions. Um, so it achieves a 40-foot span um, in the vertical direction, pure glass. And when it was built, it was the largest in the US. That's a model of that space. And then another place where they sort of push the boundaries of glass is uh, 
at the National Maritime Museum. And in this project, you can kind of see all of the different ideas coming back together. So it's integrating the modern and the old buildings and uh, pulling them together using modern technologies and experimentation with glass. So this has um, Europe's largest free span, free span glass roof, um, at least when it was built. So it's covering that entire courtyard of the old building with glass. Um, so they have a few exciting projects with glass. And then the last thing that they really focus on is urbanism and urban design. And this is the uh, South Bank Center waterfront in London, and they did the master plan for that, which is still new projects are being built for that every, every week, pretty much. So this is where um, the London Eye is, or in the bottom left corner there. Um, and the Institute, the master plan for that, this is sort of some of the effects. So before, the whole thing is this brutalist master plan with dark undercrops, roadways on the sort of place where you'd expect it to be public. And they introduced uh, shop fronts along this whole area, so converted the undercrop space, which is uh, building access originally into uh, places for people, new entrances to the theater, and it really activated the waterfront there. And it went from being sort of a place that you wouldn't want to go at night or even during the day to being one of the most popular parts of London. And it's always filled with people now. Um, so they kind of carry all of those ideas throughout most of their projects. Um, so next I'll talk about what they're working on now and what I got to work on. Uh, this is the Lyric Theater in Hammers the neighbor of Hammersmith in London. It's uh, sort of an addition to an old brutalist mall. And that addition to the top left is sort of their insertion on that building and it's adding space to a public a lyric theater so an opera house um, and they're adding rehearsal space and office spaces and um, the actual theater is in that taller volume which is part of the original building um, and they're doing some cool things on this this is a, a screen made with a sort of three different steel fin shapes that can be added together in about 100 different orientations. So you get the effect of a random wall, a uh, random screen facade, but it's actually done really simply with just three different parts, which is pretty cool and inventive. And Here's another project. So that last one, you're in the context of brutalism. This one, you're back to the Oxford context. And uh, it's just adding a little coffee shop to an old church building in Oxford for, I think, for Mansfield College. And so lots of their smaller projects in the office, they'll have like one or two people working on this type of project, and they have a handful of them going all the time. And they're sort of little exciting projects, and lots of the competitions are for projects like this, so you might get an opportunity to work on a competition for that type of project. And then this is what I spent most of my summer working on. It's a center point project, and it's a 1960s uh, skyscraper and housing arm that is being redeveloped. It used to be an office building, and now it's getting turned into residential uses. And Rick Mather Architects is doing this whole lower wing, and then <coughs> to the right here, there's not a picture of it, but they're doing a new low-income housing tower that could, sort of comes off this end. But right now, this is sort of a sad building, and all these facades are um, sort of their own thing. It's a mi mixed up, mixed match of uh, different things, and kind of a bad place to go. And so their proposal is... Um, Right now, there's a street running through the center of this, so they're planning on turning it into a square. So that brings in the urban ideas. It's fitting in within the context of this old building, which is actually a listed building by Richard Seifert. Um, so it's got some historical significance as well. 
And then they're also pushing the boundaries of glass. So on this project, we're working with uh, the engineers who did the Apple stores in all over. And they work with us on a lot of projects. And so this one, you can't really tell that this is a five meter pane of glass, a single pane with no structure behind it. Um, it's, so it's cantilever or fixed on the top and bottom. And that's how it sort of gets its strength rather than using mullions. Um, so it's really pushing the limits of what glass can do. Another aspect of that is uh, the, this entire area is a glass wall, five meter tall glass wall that opens up entirely, creating a huge open space that opens onto the new plaza that they've designed. And so when I was there, I spent most of my summer working on uh, designing the doors, the glass doors, for uh, this project and trying to figure out how to make glass doors with as little structure as possible because everything they do, they, they want to minimize the structure, maximize the sort of transparency of the project. Um, so I was working with uh, glass contractors, glass companies, door companies, to sort of figure out how um, we could make this work. I got to send drawings back and forth with the engineers, um, Eckersley Callahan, who did, they're the Apple engineers for the glass cubes and stuff that they do. Um, so it was a really cool experience to get to do that on this project. I also, so it was mostly working in lots of details and working with uh, different companies and organizing all of that. I also worked on the glass detailing packages for this project as well. So beyond just the doors, helping detail the glass. Um, yeah, and you can see here, they're trying to get the effect of here's a door and here's a door. And they want it to be about that transparent. As, so that's what the summer was spent, figuring out how to do that. And these are just some details that I was working on. Another cool aspect of this project is they did, um, they did some cool collaborations. They worked with uh, the tapestry, or the textile designer and fashion designer, Eli uh, Kishimoto. And this, so they designed a textile pattern for a fashion line that went with this building. There's lots of original mosaic tile work on the project, and so they sort of took cues from that to design these textiles. But then where it comes into play with the architecture is, this here is the low-income housing unit that's getting added on to the a lower rise uh, part of the project. And they're actually designing the textile uh, print for the tiles. We're gonna do custom tiles from that designer that are gonna uh, clad the facade of the new housing part. So it sort of will blend in with the existing building, but still be set apart so you know it's new and different. Um, and it's pretty cool that we get to do those sort of collaborations. Uh, and then just to note, we have a 10 meter glass wall there with just two panes of glass. Again, sort of a crazy amount of glass. Uh, this is another project that I worked on just at the beginning. It's another social housing project, and it's actually a passive house with over 50 units. So it's uh, UK's largest passive house building, and it's just getting finished right now. And I sort of worked on this to learn their drafting program because they don't use AutoCAD. They use a program called MicroStation. So I had to learn that on this project doing some um, sort of legal drawings, diagrams for them. And then I also got to design the signage for this project. Um, so this, uh, I did uh, decals for the windows, and then this is a steel door plate that's going to go on all the doors with the, the different door numbers for this project. And this is just near the office, but... 15 minute walk away from the office. And last I'll talk about living in London and the cool things you get to do 
with that. So again, this is the office on Camden High Street. So that's sort of like the main street of the borough of Camden. And I live up in Kentish Town. So that's it's hard to get scale in London, but this is about a 25 minute walk. It doesn't look that far, but it's a fair walk. And then it's a totally different neighborhood, um, totally different feeling up there. Um, but there's uh, Camden, just an idea of Camden. That's like where Amy Winehouse is from. And it's sort of the punk scene of London was started in Camden. So there's a few remaining punk uh, clubs left. And um, yeah, you'll see people with two-foot mohawks and crazy things like that. Um, and it's North London. So the northern line of the tube sort of follows this road, and then it splits the fork right here. But you can get to central London in about 20 minutes on the tube from Camden. And this, so I got to live in a terrace house. I found roommates on their version of Craigslist, uh, which actually worked out really well. I lived on the top two floors of that with two other roommates. Uh, which is a blast. This is the view from my window. We were on a little ridge, so I ended up getting one of the best views in London, I think. You, get, you can see the Shard, St. Paul's, St. Pancras Station, the London Eye, and then if you kept going a little to the right, you'd see the skyscraper center point that I got to work on all summer, so constant reminder of the work that you're doing. Uh, we got to to spend a lot of time on the weekends exploring London, the different neighborhoods. Um, these are just some pictures I took around. I also, it's only two hours on a train to get to Paris. So I was able to go to the Tour de France, and, which is a dream of mine. And I ended up taking the bus instead of the train. So I recommend the train. It's like an eight hour bus ride overnight. Uh, visited uh, Corbusier's apartment, another project by him as well. I got to go to Scotland, uh, another, it's actually further than Paris on the train. Uh, went to Edinburgh and Glasgow, that's the Glasgow School of Art with the new Stephen Hall, the building being built across the street from it. Went to Stuttgart and visited a bunch of cool buildings there. And we went to Switzerland um, and sort of ended up at Vols, which was amazing. And then at the end of the summer, uh, Rick Mather Architects takes their whole office on an office trip. So this past year, we got to go to Copenhagen and we spent a whole weekend there um, hanging out in the city eating really good meals, having fun together. Um, and they do this every year. So the year before, they went to, I think, Spain, southern Spain. The year before that, they went to southern France. So if you uh, are able to stay sort of a little longer, um, you get to do a lot of fun stuff like that. So this is at the end of September. Um, I guess the office environment is a lot of fun. Um, like every Friday... We all, we all go to a pub together. Um, every couple of weeks, you have a, sort of a round table, which is like wine and cheese or beer and cheese. Uh, and everybody just gets to hang out and talk about life and the projects they're working on. And um, yeah, sort of through work, you don't really need to worry about a social life. It'll, you'll have one. Um, that's, that's my summer at. Rick Mather Architects. So, does anybody have any questions about working there? Yeah. Um, how intense was the work as far as like staying late? How was this getting stuff done? Um, it's pretty good. It's a lot better than <laughs> lots of places. So, I, I think work starts at nine but you get there between 9 and 10. And then depending when you get there, um, you actually stay, um, I guess, 6 o'clock. If you get there at 9, you work till 6. 
Um, and it's all pretty casual. Like the lunch hour is you just kind of take your lunch when you want to. And they don't really keep track of stuff like that. They don't keep track of when you get in or when you leave. But just as long as you get your work done, and it's usually 9 to 6.30 or so, 9 to 7. But um, I never had to come in on the weekends, which was nice. Um, and a few times, like, when packages were due, then you had to stay late. But they feed you really good food. Like, we'd have sushi and stuff, like sashimi and you get a taxi ride home if you stayed past 10. So it's not bad. And you're kind of, it's sort of fun to stay late every once in a while as long as it's not every day. Oh. Yeah. I was just wondering if you guys use anything except for MicroStation. Um, all of the drafting is usually done in MicroStation. They're trying to move over to uh, Revit, but so far they've sort of stuck with MicroStation. Um, they do modeling and SketchUp. Um, and then lots of the Adobe Suite. So Photoshop and InDesign you'll use a lot. What were some of the biggest lessons you learned working in the um, Let's see. Well, I learned a lot about sort of working with other, like, other offices and so I, like collaborating with the window manufacturers and the engineers and the door manufacturers um, that was that was really good um, sort of forcing you to work on making connections and all of that and um, also just understanding how an office actually runs and functions and I learned a lot about detailing windows and detailing doors and all of that I don't know I learned a lot. It was a good, good time. Did you have a lot of guidance in your projects? Yeah. Well, it was sort of they'd give you something and you'd do it. You could, and then you'd get reviewed, and they'd say that like you'd get redlined, and then fix that stuff and. Um, you can ask like other people who sit around you for help. Everyone's really into helping everyone out, and it's super collaborative. And so, yeah, if you have questions, it's easy to ask. Um, yeah, you're not getting pushed off a bridge there for that one. Any other questions? And this, yeah. The application dates. I believe it's due January sixth, and then you need one to two um, recommendation letters, um, and then a portfolio. If there's signs up. I don't know the exact details. It's through Amy. Um, but yeah, portfolio. You could do an online portfolio. I think that's what they want. So. So like an issue or a website, I guess. Um, I know last, I asked last year, and um, Jerome, had, who had gotten the internship the year before, asked, like, what, he, when he got there, he asked what they liked about his portfolio. And they enjoyed the sort of experiential images um, and then having those backed by logic. So if you can show that you can make pretty buildings and pretty projects, and then back that up with some architectural merit as well. I think that's sort of what's going to help you out getting a job there. How is it coming to London? Did you have you been there before? No. And I wasn't, I, I didn't really, no, it wasn't. It was, uh, I don't know, it was a blast. And, uh, I guess I didn't really prepare for it. I didn't like have I didn't have an apartment or anything planned out. I just showed up and figured it out, and I think that worked out well for me. And uh, three days. So I mean, it's a huge city. There's you just I'd actually recommend 
um, going there and then getting a place because I found a few online that I thought were really cool and I got there and toured the places and they're really awful and or in like a really bad neighborhood. Um, so you really just need to find a way to like stay in a hostel for a few days or see if anyone... I, I got to stay in someone's uh, flat who, from the office who was out of town for the first two weeks. So they'll help you out like that, um, make it a little easier. And I, even, I just got a cell phone, a track phone when I got there. So like pay per the minute type of thing and was able to figure it all out like in the moment. Which sounds a little scary, but apparently uh, the one year that someone did um, get a place beforehand, they had the worst places, like really far away, not a nice neighborhood, and they hadn't met the roommates, so they didn't really get along that well. So. He got a place after he got there. He didn't have as good of an experience with housing as I did, but uh, I don't know. You get a pretty good stipend, so it's, uh, I don't know, worth getting a nice, like, a little bit nicer place if you can afford it so that you don't have to, like, live in the social housing or anything. Um, food wasn't, oh, well, yeah, it's expensive. It's all sort of like American prices, but in pounds, so it's one and a half times more expensive. But I think the stipend reflects that, so you'll be fine. As far as the projects that you worked on, they're just designing things, or not? Yeah, um, you just sort of have a task and yeah. deadlines and... Um, if you don't have anything, you kind of ask around the office and figure out who has something for you to do. Um, and uh, you end up getting sort of an architect who's your mentor, in a way. Um, so that's pretty fun. And I got to work on a few different projects. Uh, another cool thing is I actually I didn't have my own desk, which meant I sort of moved around as people were out of the office, and that way I actually got to meet more people. I think it was a nicer setup for a summer internship to be able to sit by everyone in the office and get to know everyone and that way you can figure out who to ask for certain things and yeah it's great yeah um, I think you're able to get I didn't do that, but you can get like special hours that don't get signed off. There's some sort of bracket that works for that, but I didn't do it. I don't know. <laughs> Probably should have. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other thing. Six months. Uh, if you are able to take an extra three months off, they'll probably ask you to work for a full six if you're interested. That's like how long a visa lasts. And so most people have to go back for credit requirements, but you might get the opportunity to stay for a full six months, which would probably be a blast. You didn't have to get a visa for right? You don't need a visa. No, you need a visa for working. Yeah. So they'll sort of that's sort of a hassle, but you'll, they'll help you figure that out. They, we go, you go through a program that sponsors you. Not, it's like separate from the office. Um, and now that they're doing it earlier, it'll be easier to actually get that figured out. You won't have to stress out about it. When did you actually go there? Like, did you start? I started on June 24th. That was the first day I worked. I think I landed on June 18th. Met, I like met people in the office, but then had a few days to find my apartment. Recommend doing that. I know Jerome, who had a hard time getting a good apartment, started working his first day. So I'd definitely ask for a few days to get settled and figure stuff out if you don't have an apartment figured out.
Um, and then I sort of worked to the very end. But you also, so I got to travel so much because you get vacation time there and bank holidays, so, because their rules, their social laws are a lot better. <laughs> so I got five days of vacation, and then I think there's one or two bank holidays. So over the course of three months, I had six or seven days off, uh, which is awesome. And I definitely try and like take advantage of living in London because it's so easy to get anywhere, so much cheaper, and a lot of fun to travel. All right. Any last questions? Great. Thank you, guys. If you have any future questions, you can find me in studio or email me. There's also a book of their work in the library, and I'd recommend checking it out before you write the cover letter to your... I have no idea. I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> no, it's just like those connections are like not good. Like it really sucks. Yeah, I know, but Can you do it? Yeah, I mean, I It's so hard to pick projects because there's so many good projects. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those were renderings before before the details were there. What I was, yeah. Yes. It's very exciting. Saturday.